I was, um, as, as Pastor Jerry was talking about purchasing paper uh, to go towards John and Romans and tracks and different things, I was reminded of my childhood. Uh, I grew up on the mission field in Honduras. My parents were missionaries there for many years between uh, Honduras and Chile. And uh, we'd go out to the Central Park in the city once a month, and we'd, my dad would, he'd have a big box of tracks that we either received from the states or that we had printed up there in Honduras. Um, usually around a thousand, between between a thousand or two thousand tracks, and we'd we'd go out there, everybody from the church, and we'd distribute it and share Christ. And um, it was one of my favorite Sundays, Sunday nights out of the month, because uh, after tracks, Dad would invite us to, or he would uh, buy ice cream for us there on the uh, ice cream shop on the park. So for me, it wasn't going out and sharing tracks. It was like ice cream at the end. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I remember lots of times seeing some of those tracks getting thrown down on the floor. People get up and they'd leave. And, uh, you know, the people from that would have to clean up the park, they'd give us some mean looks like, thanks a lot, you know. And uh, I remember seeing a lot of those on the ground and saying, you know, it, it, sometimes it just seems kind of like a, a waste. Uh, just, just all this effort to, for, for this to end up on the ground and, and uh, people not caring. Um, and then I remember uh, on one occasion, uh, my dad picked up the phone because it was ringing and he answered and uh, he talked for a while and a big smile spread out on, across his face and then he hung up and, and uh, we were like, what was that all about? He said, well, I just, I just received a call from somebody that received a tract uh, that was thrown to him from our van. We'd do that every now and then. We'd, we had a box of tracks in our car when we were kids, and uh, my dad would, would tell us to roll them up, and then as we passed by people that were on the side of the road, he'd say, now, 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 we'd be shooting them out like crazy, you know. It was, it was the greatest kid. Uh, for, as a kid, it was the greatest thing in the world. And, uh, but he received a call once, and uh, it was somebody calling to say, you know, I, I picked up one of those tracks that somebody threw out of a car, and I just was calling the number that was on the back here to let you know that I got saved, and uh, I'm on my way to heaven, so praise the Lord. I mean, you talk about uh, John and Romans, uh, 15 cents, but what's the value really when you, when you think about the truth that's contained in that book of John and Romans? It's not just 15 cents. It's priceless. And uh, so praise the Lord for what's taking place. Praise the Lord for all those boxes that represent souls that will be reached and that will have access to God's truth. Amen. So exciting. Uh, last night we talked about the starting place of missions. Tonight we're going to talk about the principles regarding missions. And um, as, I was, as I was looking at this, I was thinking about that word principle. And uh, trying to remember how to spell it, making sure it wasn't principal with P-A-L at the end, you know, but P-L-E. And uh, I, I, was, I was wanting to put this into words just to, to make sure that we're on the same page and we understand what we're going to talk about tonight. So I started looking up some definitions. Uh, first of all, I went to Merriam-Webster. And uh, here's, here's what I came across. And I think you have these uh, there on the screen. Merriam-Webster uh, defines principle as this, a comprehensive and fundamental law, doctrine, or assumption. It sounded a little vague to me. I wanted to get a little more specific, and, and I wanted it to be simpler, so I looked up another definition. This was on vocabulary.com that says a principle is a kind of rule, belief, or idea that guides you. Then I thought that's too simplistic, and I don't like a definition that includes the word kind of. You know, it's eh, kind of this, but not really, you know. And so then I went to Wikipedia. <laughs> Wikipedia says a principle, but this was actually pretty good. It says a principle is a fundamental truth or proposition that serves as the foundation for a system of beliefs or behavior or a chain of reasoning. Okay, so that, that, that I thought was a pretty good definition, but then I thought, maybe somebody can do better. So I went to ChatGPT, and uh, here's, here's the computer's definition. A principle refers to a fundamental truth, concept, or rule that serves as a foundation or basis for thinking, reasoning, or behavior. You know what? 
AI wins. <laughs> and that's what I figure. You know, they're talking about uh, artificial intelligence taking over, and they actually had, you know, it actually had the best definition, in my, in my opinion. A fundamental truth, a concept, or a rule that serves as a foundation or a basis for the way we think, the way we reason, or how we act. Some examples of principles would be honesty, fairness, uh, respect for others, the scientific method, you know, is a way, is, is a basis, is a foundation on which you can get guaranteed results. Uh, in the Bible, we see some principles towards life, sowing and reaping, for example, you know, you, you, you reap what you sow, um, you give, you get, uh, give and it shall be given unto you. Those are basic foundational principles. And when you look at missions, there are some principles that are also the foundation for the way that God works in this world. And so what I'd like to look at tonight is, is those principles regarding our mission. And there might be more than just these three that I'm going to share with you tonight, but these serve as a pretty good foundation and, a, and it gives us something to work on, something to understand how God works. And um, it all revolves around certain expectations that either God has or that we can have as we go about carrying uh, the Lord's mission to reach the lost. And, and when it comes to missions, these are underlying principles that we need to be aware of. It helps us understand, it helps us relate to it a little better, and it helps us to know what to expect uh, from God and to know what God expects from us as well. So the first principle regarding our mission is this. God expects us to live by faith. That's, that's the first thing. We know that mission starts in our heart. Uh, guard your heart, for out of it are the issues of life. But there's something that God will always expect from us and in relation, in, in, in regarding how we respond to him. And he is going to expect for there to be faith in our lives. God expects us to live by faith. That's principle number one. God is pleased when we trust in his direction and in his provision for our life. And we all know what Hebrews 11:6 6 says, without faith it is impossible to please him for he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so I'm going to share, I'd like to look at a, a, a Bible passage tonight. It's uh, Luke chapter 9 and 10. And we're going to look at some verses in this chapter that kind of have to do with the, with the disciples and with certain things that happened in Jesus' ministry that teach us or where we see these principles um, in action. So the book of Luke chapter 9 and verses 1 through 6. I'm just going to read these first six verses and then share a few thoughts about this. Speaking about Jesus, it says, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves nor scrip, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. And whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide, and thence depart. And whosoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And they departed and went throughout the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere, according to the, the way God had blessed them and with the power that he gave them to do so. You know, there are certain times when we can voluntarily exercise faith. Uh, you know, Pastor Jerry talked about those cards and uh, making a commitment to fill out those cards with a certain amount and uh, bringing that to the Lord every month. And that's, that's a way that we exercise faith voluntarily. Nobody's forcing us to do it. Nobody's obligating us to do it. I got involved getting to missions when I was, I think I was seven years old. Uh, we used to get $2.50 as an allowance every month, not every day, not every week, every month. This was back in the 70s or early 80s. And uh, I'd set aside uh, a 50-cent Honduran uh, uh, coin 
for tithe, and then another 50 cent uh, coin for missions, because we got five lempiras, which was the Honduran uh, monetary system. And so I started doing that from when I was seven years old, and um, I, I've started to give a little bit more uh, to missions, <laughs> not just a quarter every month, you know. Uh, I'm up to about three dollars uh, or so. No, I, I do a little bit more than that. Um, but it's been, it, it's, it's always been intriguing for me to, uh, thinking about, you know, how many souls have been won as a result of that. Uh, I've been giving to missions for 40 years and to missionaries all over the world and uh, through, through different churches, the churches that, that, that we minister in and that we've ministered in. Uh, I just got word today from one of the missionaries that we support uh, as a church in Chile. We support a family that's working with uh, the Muslims from Morocco that live in the country of Spain. And uh, he was just telling me that this week or a couple weeks ago, uh, a man that they've been praying for for the longest time, a Muslim, a dedicated Muslim, was converted to the Lord. He finally received the Lord, and uh, he, he got baptized. And um, I've got a video of that, and I'll probably share it one of these evenings just so you can rejoice and see that. And, and uh, winning a Muslim to the Lord is, is very difficult. And so they've been really patient and very consistent in their sharing, but I had a part of that, you know, because I've been giving to missions, I've been giving to that work, and uh, so I'm, I'm winning Muslims uh, in Spain. Amen. Who would have thought, you know? And, and, and your, your participation in missions, you've, you're winning people all over the world. And who knows? Who knows uh, how God has used that? But again, there are certain times and there are certain occasions where we can voluntarily exercise our faith. Uh, for example, when we participate in giving to missions. But then there are other times when it's when God places us in situations or leads us to do something that demands that we exercise faith. It's not always just voluntary. Sometimes God says, I want you to do this and this is how you're going to have to do it. I think about Abraham. You know, he's he's often referred to as the man of faith. You know, when the Bible talks about somebody that had faith, oftentimes they go back to Abraham and think about his calling. Abraham, I want you I want you to leave your city and I'm going to I'm going to give you a good land. I'm going to promise you I'm going to build a nation out of you and I'm going to give you uh, land. Uh, you just start walking. And Abraham says, which direction? Head north. And so, OK, uh, honey, I guess we're heading north. You know, let's gather our things and let's go. And so they start walking. And here we have a situation that's kind of similar. Uh, we read about these disciples, and, and, and Jesus says, I want you to go out and start preaching the gospel. I'm going to give you power to heal, and this is going to be convincing to the rest of the Jews that you're working in my name. And, uh, but here are a few things he says. I don't want you to take any provisions. I don't want you to take an extra coat. I don't want you to take anything with you other than what you're wearing and uh, no reservations. You just go and whoever opens up your door to you and uh, uh, invites you into the house, you stay there. If nobody does so, you just shake off the dust of your feet to let them know that God's not pleased with them and you keep going on your way. Now, how many of us would be willing to do that? If we had to plan a trip and God says, uh, David, I want you to go down to Mexico this week. And, uh, okay, Lord, for how long? You just do what I say. Um, okay, is this weeks, days, months? A uh, little planning? Can I, can I plan on this? You know, if, if we were thinking about going down to Mexico for two or three months, we probably have a long list of supplies and things that we want to carry with us. You know, we want to have some money in the bank to make sure that we can purchase what we need down there. And uh, imagine if Jesus said this to us. You just head down that way, and whoever receives you into, your, into their home, you stay with them. And if they don't, you just keep on walking. And would you be willing to do that? Well, that's what, that's what Jesus was asking his disciples to do. Not just asking him, but saying, here's what you're going to do. And uh, they said, okay, this sounds pretty, this sounds different. But that's one of the principles when it comes to missions, is that God expects us to live by faith. He expects us to respond simply to his word, not, not knowing everything that's going to happen, not knowing how it's going to happen or how it's going uh, to come about or to take place. 
But the disciples were simply going to have to trust the Lord for his provision and for his direction. And it, it looks like they were not prepared for what was going to take place. And in spite of their apparent lack of preparation, guess what? God took care of them. He took care of them for weeks. He took care of them for months, perhaps. And when they all came back, they had these wonderful stories to talk about. And they were all rejoicing. You know, we got to do this. We got to do this. You, you never would have believed the palace that we stayed in. <laughs> and good for you. We stayed in a dump, you know. And, but, but they were doing God's work. And they were caring about God's business. And so that's a principle that we need to understand. When it comes to missions, we simply have to trust the Lord and rely on him and live by faith. But there's another principle that we can see in this passage, and it's Luke chapter 9, verses 10 through 17. Um, speaking of the apostles here, when they return, it says, And the apostles, when they were returned, told him all that they had done. And he took them and went aside privately into a desert place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. And the people, when they knew it, followed him, and he received them and spake unto them of the kingdom of God and healed them that had need of healing. And when the day began to wear away, then came the twelve and said unto him, Send the multitude away that they may go into the towns and country round about and lodge and get victuals or food, provisions, for we are here in a desert place. So here we see the disciples are actually being kind of considerate. You know, the people had come out from, from afar to hear the the, the Lord preach and, and to heal them. Uh, and, and as the day was drawing to a close, they realized, you know, these, these people are probably hungry. They've been, they've been out here for a while. And uh, so, Lord, maybe it's a good time to, to send them all away so they can go get provisions and find a place to, to, to rest for the evening. And here's principle number two. Principle number one, like I said, is God expects us to live by faith. Principle number two is that when we live by faith, we should begin to expect the unexpected. And sometimes God's going to throw us a curveball. You know, sometimes God's going to throw something our way that we weren't exactly expecting, but he expects us to do it regardless. And he has his reasons for doing this. And sometimes it's just to teach us something. Sometimes it's because he wants us to do something. And so the disciples come and they say, Lord, time to send them home. But... Verse 13, he said unto them, what? Give ye them to eat. <laughs> that, my friends, was not expected, you know. <laughs> the disciples are like, Lord, the only solution we can see here is for you to send them home. And, uh, and Jesus looks at them and says, hey, you take care of their dinner, you know. You give them food to eat. Well, definitely that was not what they were expecting. And so they said, we have no more but five loaves and two fishes. You know, and in this passage, it seems like it was, it was something that they said right off the bat. But they actually went out looking for food. And uh, in the other books, as we read them, uh, we had a young lad that came up to him. You know, and they probably started asking, hey, anybody got some food? You know, how, how much do we have? Do we have enough to, uh, to feed a crowd? And... Um, uh, they started counting out their money, and, you know, one of the disciples said to Jesus, not, not even this amount is enough to be able to, to cover the needs for this many people. And so when they finally worked out all the numbers, they, they came back to Jesus, and they said, we have no more but five loaves and two fishes, except we should go and buy meat for all this people. And then they said, you know, but even this amount that we have isn't enough. For there were about 5,000 men. That's just the men. And he said to his disciples, make them sit down by fifties in a company. And they did so and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and break and gave to the disciples to set before the multitude. And they did eat and were all filled. And there was taken up fragments that remained to them, 12 baskets. That again was unexpected. The disciples would have never seen that coming even though they were able to see you know the water turned into wine and they knew the lord could do those things they weren't expecting to feed that great multitude that night not with five loaves and two fishes when we live by faith and 
we learn to expect the unexpected, you know what happens? There are no limits. And there are no limits with God. And that just broadens our horizons because we stop living by, you know, what we can accomplish and we begin to think about what God can accomplish. And notice he did it through his disciples. Um, we may not know exactly how God is going to do it or how he's going to use what I have or who I am, but he definitely does it. Regarding the same passage, John describes this, uh, John chapter 6 and verse 6. Philip had asked him, you know, in verse 5 he says, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this Jesus said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. God already knows what needs to take place. God already knows how he's going to do it. But he still wants us to be mindful of who he is and what he can do. And I think when he told the disciples there and he said, give them ye to eat, it was just to remind them that what he was going to do was impossible to men. And what is impossible to us is very possible to the Lord. Amen. And so I think that's what he, what he was trying to drive home when he said that. You give them to eat. I'm sorry, Lord, we can't do that. Imagine if the goal was a million John and Romans in one week. Think you could get it accomplished? <laughs> You're like, eh, that's a lot of stapling. <laughs> you start running the numbers, and it seems like an impossible task. But if that was what God would set on, on our hearts to do during a week, God has no limits. God brought over a cutter from, you know, another church. They came and delivered it. Who says, who says another church couldn't join in on all this fun? You know? And sometimes, sometimes we, we, we start to limit God because we think in our own terms. But we need to learn that God expects us to expect the unexpected when it comes to him, especially when it becomes or when it comes to missions. Now, I remember as a, as a Bible student, I might have shared this story before, but as a Bible student, uh, you know, paying my way through college, I wanted to graduate debt-free, so I was working 40 hours a week at a hotel and studying the rest of the time. And um, I had, uh, we had a missions conference at the church there in Springfield, and uh, I had committed for the first three years uh, $25 a month, and I was able to make that. And then the Lord placed a certain amount on my heart, $40, excuse me, $40 a week. Uh, so $160 for a college student back then for missions, after tithes, you know, uh, was a hefty amount. But I had seen God work through and, and do great things before. And uh, he had multiplied that quarter, and it kept growing and growing and growing. And, but when the Lord placed that amount on my heart, I was like, whoa, that's, that's a little hefty, Lord. I don't know if I can come up with that. But if that's, what you're, if that's what you're leading me to do, I guess I'll do it. So I picked up one of the commitment cards and, and filled in $40 a week. <sighs> Hoping that I didn't get the numbers wrong, you know? <laughs> Why don't you have that moment? Are you sure, Lord? And uh, so I, I knew I could, I could come up with $25, and I was on a tight budget, so I knew I could come up with $25 a week. Um, I'm sorry, excuse me, it was, it was $15. I'm, I'm switching my numbers around. Uh, $15 a week, I could commit to $60 a month. So I was thinking, I'm going to have to come up with another $25 a week somehow. And, uh, you know, I was, I was a little concerned about this, uh, thinking, how am I going to do this? I was, I was kind of, you know, rubbing my hands in anticipation, expecting to get a raise at work. And, uh, but that didn't happen. And... Uh, Towards the end of the week, I was approached by a friend, and uh, he said, hey, Dave, I'm, uh, uh, he had a paper route that he used to run, and he said, I I'm needing help. Sunday mornings, I need to, I need to fill in uh, and bag some papers, and because um, they have all the ads in them, you know, the Sunday edition's a lot thicker, and so he said, the, the, the guy that was helping me, he switched jobs, he's not gonna be able to help me anymore, so uh, are you interested? And I said, uh, what does it involve? Oh, you know, it's, it's from 2 in the morning till 5 in the morning. You get up and you roll the papers and then you get to go home. <laughs> okay, so, ooh, 
I was already working, you know, 40 hours a week. And so I said, uh, how much does it pay? He said, $25 uh, per week. <laughs> from two to five in the morning, Lord? <laughs> okay, that was unexpected, but it paid the bills. And, uh, you know, it was, it, it, it was rough, but uh, ministry is rough, and sometimes as a pastor, you, you get to wake up uh, real early in the morning and minister to people, and so uh, I guess I was just training for, for what, what was to come. Uh, God has no limits, and God works in unexpected ways. Uh, and we can try to crunch numbers as much as we can, but God doesn't have to. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he can provide the resources from, from anywhere that he desires. All it takes from us is obedience. And, and notice, notice what happened here. God took care of the miracle. He didn't, he didn't ask the disciples to, to multiply all that or to cut it up into real small portions or anything. He just started breaking bread as if it was the most normal thing in the world to do. And, and before, before this crowd, and eventually there was food for everyone. And not just, not just food so everyone could be satisfied. They even had leftovers. And so there we see God at work. But here's another thing that we see is that God he asked the disciples to get involved. He didn't just lay out the food and say, okay, everybody come and feed yourselves. He said, disciples, you need to get to work. You know, he provides the miracle, but he still expects us to work. God provided the $25 a week, but I still had to get up at two in the morning and go out there and roll all those papers. And, and uh, so we still have to work. And when it comes to missions, God will do the miracles that need to be performed, but we still have to get involved in prayer. We still have to share. We still have to give to missions. So that takes us to a third principle regarding missions. The first one is that God expects us to live by faith. The second one is that God expects us to expect the unexpected when we live by faith. And finally, and this is extremely important because as we live by faith and God begins to do unexpected things in our lives, sometimes we begin to focus on those, those great miracles that happen in our lives. And I talked about not letting our heart get diverted uh, last night and keeping our focus on what's important. And sometimes we can get all excited about the results and we can get excited about the miracles that take place and forget what's truly important. And so the last thing, the last principle we need to remember is that God expects us to remain focused on him, even in the midst of the miracles that he provides. Because more important than, than what God does is who God is. And that can never be replaced. And that's what I see here in the rest of this passage. Um, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 and the first, uh, we'll just start reading in verse number 1. Uh, it's 1 through 12. Um, After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Just as he did with the 12 disciples, he decided that, you know, people, people needed their hearts to be prepared, so he sent 70 out. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse, nor scrip, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house, and into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. Oh, no. You know, uh, it was great coming here tonight and having some beautiful meatloaf set in front of me. You know, that was, that was amazing. But that's not always the case. Sometimes you visit with people and it's like, ooh, these are slim pickings and 
uh, or I remember my dad talked about a trip he took to India once, and uh, you know they'd set stuff down before him, and he had to he'd have to kind of scoop it up with his fingers and just put it into his mouth, no forks, no knives, nothing like that. You know his hands were his silverware, and uh, he leaned over once because his plate looked kind of strange, and uh, he said he said to his his friend, his missionary friend, "What are we eating? What is this?" Don't ask, just eat it. <laughs> He's like, okay. <laughs> and then and then he explained and he said, he said, you have to eat it. Because he had like 20, 20 little kids around him just watching him eat. And he thought, this is so uncomfortable. And he started, he started wanting to share, and the guy said, Don't, just eat it. And then he explained, you know, that, that plate of food that you had in front of you that day, that's more than they eat in a whole week. And so that was their offering to him as a minister of the word. And so, uh, you know, sometimes it's just, it's just better not to ask. And so Jesus says, whatever they set before you, that's what you eat. And heal the sick that are therein and say unto them, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. Verse 10, but into whatsoever city ye enter and they receive you not, go your ways out into the street of the same and say, even the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you, notwithstanding be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in the day for Sodom than for that city. What's interesting to me is that what Jesus instructed the disciples to do at first, his 12 disciples, these 70, it was kind of the same formula, you know, kind of the same thing. And that's because God is the same yesterday and today and and he will be the same tomorrow. And so we need to learn from these experiences and, 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 and learn to trust the Lord just as he expected these disciples to trust him then. We need to continue doing the same today because God's expectations haven't changed. But going back to my main point that God expects us to remain focused on him, notice, notice what happened when these 70 came back to give a report to the Lord. And it says, verse 17, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Somebody is possessed with the devil, and we say, Devil, you get out of there, and they leave. Wow, that's unheard of. That, that is powerful stuff right there. What a, what a gift you have given us. And they were rejoicing and, and remembering how the people were just awed by this effect. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven, perhaps a prophecy in regards to future things. But he says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. He had indeed given them uh, great authority. But notice this, verse 20, Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not. Don't get so happy about the fact that you can say to a demon, get out, and he'll do it. Don't get so happy about the fact that you can heal somebody. You know, they come to you, and they have, they have this horrible sickness, and you're able to say, in the name of the Lord Jesus, be healed, and they're healed. Don't get so happy about that. And they're all like, what? You know, but this was amazing. These were awesome experiences. We've never, we'd never seen this before. And... He says, don't rejoice about that, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice. And there's a comparison here. So we understand, you know, we can get excited about this, but there's something that we should get excited about more. And he says, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. If you want to be happy about something, get happy and rejoice about the fact that you belong to God and that you are his and that you are safe and secure for eternity. That's why there's great rejoicing in the heavens when a soul is snatched from the depths of hell. When someone is saved, when someone is uh, rescued. And I, I had stopped there uh, in my thoughts when I prepared this message the first time. And I was looking over my notes again today. And I just happened to continue reading this passage and um, I noticed something else here. Remember, principle number three is God expects us to remain focused on him. And there's something really neat here. It says, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit 
now it's Jesus rejoicing, and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me and my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. And he turned him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. These things that you got to experience, these experiences, they're all good and great, but you need to focus on this. You need to focus on me. And you need to focus on my Father who is in heaven. Although wonderful experiences, and I, lo you know, I, I, I go back and I remember about this person calling my dad and telling me I got saved through this tract. And, and I go back in my mind and remember how the Lord provided for me when I committed uh, voluntarily to a certain amount, but in obedience to what the Lord had shown me. And, and, and those are great experiences, but I can't remember, I can't forget, and I should never forget, neither should you, that the greatest experience you can have is knowing the Lord Jesus Christ and knowing who the Father is because of that and knowing that you're safe and secure in his arms because of that and knowing that you have the privilege of serving the Lord God Almighty. That is, that is what ultimately we need to be focused on. And some people say place so much focus on the miraculous experiences that they have along the way that they forget about the greater blessing. And it's that, that we belong to God. And they forget about the greater purpose that we have, which is to worship the Lord as we obey him, as we remain in awe of who he is and what they do. Basically, when I looked at these verses and it says, you are blessed because you get to see what others desired so much to see. And Jesus rejoiced and he says, I thank thee, Father, that you have hid these things from the wise and prudent, but revealed them unto babes. You know what really gets the Lord excited is when we get it, is when we grasp on to his vision and when we understand how he works and when we understand that, that God expects for us to, unex, that to expect the unexpected, that God expects us to live by faith, but when we do, God will do miracles in and through us. And I hope you can remember these principles as you go about the rest of your life fulfilling the Lord's mission, but above all, remember that we are to remain focused on him. He is the center of everything we do and the reason for what we do. So let our heart and our mind remain in him always. Let's have a word of prayer. We thank you, Lord, for... Guadalajara, a beautiful city full of great culture, with easy access from any part of the country, whether by sea, air, or land, it has become the second largest city in Mexico. Every year thousands of people come to enjoy the beautiful landscapes, great climate, and culinary art. However, Guadalajara is no stranger to broken homes destroyed by alcohol, drugs, crime, corruption, homosexuality, and the highest level in suicide. No doubt there is a great need for the gospel in Guadalajara. For this reason, Victorio and Marie Robles are willing to respond to God's calling. After almost 30 years serving under Pastor Kevin Wynn in diverse ministries such as Children's Church, Sunday School, Bus Ministry, 
full-time soul winners, Jewish ministry, Bible clubs, evangelism, discipleship, and heavily involved in the church planting ministry. Just when they thought that their lives were set in stone and that they would serve God in Montesion until he called them home, God called them to serve him in Guadalajara. They did not know how, they did not know exactly where, and they had no idea how God would provide financially. But within three weeks, Victoria was sure of his calling. They packed what they could inside of an old suburban and started heading towards Guadalajara. Six years ago, we arrived in Guadalajara. Immediately, we started Iglesia Bautista Biblica El Faro in a rented house using the Bible method of Matthew 28, 18 to 20. We went out soul winning. We brought him to church to get him baptized. And we taught him to observe all these things through discipleship. God began to bless. And within a month, the house was full. We all were very excited. Well, all except the owner of the house. And she kicked us out. We rented a different house. But the new Christians did not follow us. We had to start all over. Using the same Bible method, we got the same results. The house was full again, and we decided to start another church. So we started Iglesia Bautista Biblica Divina Gracia. <laughs> same Bible method, same results. The house was full again. God provided a property for us. We cleaned it up and merged both churches. This was our first service in that property. Dr. Carolina started coming to our church. She had a burden to reach the Wiradica people to Christ. She invited us to go with her. It was an unbelievable trip. These people knew very little about the Bible, and they did not believe in our God. So we felt the Lord calling us to start a church here. But the doors were closed, so we decided to start another church in Guadalajara. This is one of our services. We continue trying to start the church in Wirarica territory, and the Lord opened some doors. We started Iglesia Bautista Biblica Divina Gracia in Wiradica territory. Roads are very rough and we have to walk to these communities. We get used clothes, toys, and whatever we can attract to attract these people to the gospel. These are some of the results.
We now have property and we are in the process of building our first auditorium in Wiradica territory. Our church in Guadalajara continues growing. I am actually preaching in two different churches. Now the Lord has given us several soul winners and we are in the process of buying this property. When we do, we will merge both churches. Please continue praying for us. Thank you for your help. God bless you. <laughs>